Hi, my name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services for Sunday, July the 9th. Uh, we will sing some songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial, enlightening, and edifying. We sing from songs of faith and praise. I will give you the name of uh, the song and the number. If you have the book, that's great. If not, you can either use the book you have or Google the song so that you can sing along with us. The first song that we will sing is number 202, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. If the music to this song sounds lovely, uh, the music is by uh, this guy named Ludwig von Beethoven. <coughs> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, God of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. The next song is Thy Word, number 449. 449. Thy Word. <clears throat> Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. And before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 351. He bore it all. Lively song. <clears throat> My precious Savior suffered pain and agony, he bore it freely all. bore it all. That I, might I with him might live. He, he took the bonds of sin and set the captive the free. He bore it all oh, that oh, I might live. Jesus bore it all, see his shining face, he bore it all, that I might live, with him to die, Jesus took place and bore it all, that I might live. They placed a crown of thorns upon my Savior, said, Freely bore it all, I with them might live between the men with spears, his side was pierced through, he bore it all that I might live. Jesus bore it all, I with him might live, bore it all that I might live. Him to die, Jesus, Jesus took my, my place, he bore it all oh, that oh, I might oh, live. Up Calvary's hill in shame, the blessed Savior trod, freely bore it all. I with him might live between two thieves they crucified the Son of God. He bore it all that I might live. Jesus bore it all. See his shining face. He bore it all that I might live. Stood condemned to die. Freely took my place, he bore it all that I might live. On the first day of the week, we are commanded to uh, uh, take part in the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is uh, very, very directly uh, quoted for us in the 20th chapter of Acts and the seventh verse. And they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. This was in memory of Jesus' crucifixion. It was in memory of Jesus, uh, the Son of God and the Son of Man, coming to earth uh, as a human uh, with the frailties and physical frailties of humans, the ability to be tempted the ability to do wrong, yet did no wrong. And this Jesus uh, bore it all. He bore our sins. He suffered pain and agony upon the cross. And so as we gather about the table, let's remember uh, what Jesus did for us. First, let's remember his suffering body as it hung on the tree as we pray for the bread. We're just so grateful to Heavenly Father that Jesus did indeed uh, bore it all on the hill of Calvary. And we understand that uh, the physical agony that he suffered, he suffered for each one of us. That his body, which was in excruciating pain, was in that excruciating pain that we might live. As we partake of the bread, help us to remember the body as it hung on the cross. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. We know that they placed a crown of thorns on our Savior's head. And we know that uh, a spear was driven into his side. We know that his hands were nailed to the cross in 
as were his feet. And we know that uh, from all of those wounds, Jesus shed his precious blood. We know that is the blood of our new salvation, the blood that brings grace to us and the blood that washes away our sins. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that uh, you chose this path for us to send your son to earth to die on the cross, to shed his innocent blood. Help us to understand that the only forgiveness that we have is through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Be with us as we partake. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> With the Lord's Supper completed, we also at this time remember that on the first day of the week we are to lay by in store and give back to the Lord that which we have been prospered. Not a tenth, that which we have been prospered. Let's just remember how prosperous we indeed are. Let's remember that our God loves a cheerful giver. That our God, even in the Old Testament days, expected the best when people sacrificed. Let us take this opportunity as we give back to the Lord. Consider it a sacrifice. Consider it something that we give back to the Lord so that uh, his word can be spread and that those less fortunate can be helped. Let's pray for the giving. We just uh, humbly come before you, Heavenly Father, realizing that all good things come from you, realizing that nothing is truly our own, realizing that we came in to this world with nothing. And from that same physical standpoint, we will leave the world with nothing. Help us as we give back to understand that uh, these monies are physically used to support the church which Jesus died for. We just pray that those that uh, utilize these funds will do so the way they should be used, that others may come to Christ, and that those that are less fortunate than we can be aided. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song that we'll sing is number 31. It's a very, very short song, but a very poignant one that comes from the 46th chapter of the book of Psalms that simply says, be still and know. <clears throat> be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that strengthens me. I am the Lord that strengthens me. I am the Lord that strengthens me. Our song service is completed. I hope that uh, you were uplifted by the singing as I was and that uh, the Lord was praised in our songs. Uh, my message this evening, again, if you were there this morning, uh, you heard that uh, the title of the lesson this evening would be Coping with Life. And it is dealing with four myths about coping with life. How many of you are old enough to remember um, our mom, probably, cooking with this device called a pressure cooker. Uh, if you remember, it was this funny thing that sat on the stove. It was clasped shut, and it was used to, uh, when we 
when preserves were made and the, the, the things that were preserved were put under pressure so that the lids would seal and they would remain sealed until uh, that uh, whatever was preserved was used. Sometimes I think we live in a pressure cooker of life because that's what the pressure cooker was designed to do. In Cheers, uh, there's that famous line by Norm when he comes in and he says, we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world and I'm eating milk bone underwear. It almost seems that way in our lives. Uh, many couples feel the need in feeding their families to spend hours and hours away from the home when they should spend more time with their family. And so with that, we see some of the really negatives of life that I would like to deal with this this evening, excuse me. In our lives, when things go wrong, tempers flare. Uh, patience is sometimes very, very, very short. I think there's an old term uh, that is used that uh, we become mind blown, our, our minds are blown. Uh, people snap at other people. Uh, and some people, rather than really cope with it, drop out. And it is really, really unfortunate when this is a Christian person who thinks that all the things that have happened to him and the world that this person lives in are things that they can't cope with. And since they are unable to cope with life itself, they succumb to the pressures of sin. I would like to deal with four myths this evening about coping with life and how we are to cope with it. First of all, there is this myth that when we become a Christian, that all of our problems will be solved. You know, the, the blood of Christ washes away all sins as we find in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And we find this also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. But that being said, the fact that we can have our sins forgiven does not alter the fact that even as Christians, we will have problems in our life. As a matter of fact, when we become Christians and make a commitment to God. Satan makes a commitment to himself to try to tear down which God has tried to build up. And, and the ones that probably are just, uh, uh, the, the ones that will probably either succumb to or have their, their Christianity, Christianity tested are young Christians as they face the, the, I guess the, uh, the turmoil that comes with life. You know, we almost think when we get dipped in the waters of baptism and we become a new creature that it's all over now. You know, we're saved and now life will go on and just be a, you know, that proverbial bowl of cherries, but it just, doesn't work that way. The good thing about Christianity is that in coping with problems, we're able to turn to the Lord. That's the positive idea. Never said that problems would go away. We have righteous men like Job who suffered tremendously. We have that wonderful example of Joseph who was mistreated in Genesis chapter 37 to Genesis chapter 50. And, and the sad part was that he was mistreated by his family. And again, we had lesson last Sunday morning from the book of Daniel. And Daniel was persecuted. And his persecution came not because he was horrible, but because he stood by his beliefs. And so with that in mind this evening, first, let's, let's destroy the myth that when we become Christians, 
that all of our problems immediately disappear into thin air. Secondly, and this one is hooked very closely to the first one, and the second myth is that if you're having problems, you must not be a spiritual being. This was a false idea that the Jews had in the Old Testament. Brethren, problems are part of life, whether one is spiritual or whether one is not spiritual. Now here's the big question, and here's hopefully what this lesson is all about. What do we do with this? How do we handle these problems? Going back to the introduction, how do we, how do we deal with hearts bleeding? How do we deal with nerves being frazzled? How do we deal with uh, our stomach churning when things don't go the way they should? How do we deal with the, uh, I guess, with the temptation to snap at, at the slightest things? Well, uh, this does not mean if we are tempted to do those things that we're not spiritual. And with that myth comes the question, how do we handle it? I'm saving the good part for the end. The third myth uh, is the myth that just because one has become a Christian, that means that we are automatically mature, uh, that we've been dipped into the waters of baptism and we come out a mature Christian. Wrong. We come out a new Christian. We come out a saved Christian. But we don't come out a mature Christian. I think it takes a degree of maturity to understand that we must become Christians, that we must obey the plan of salvation. But spiritual maturity comes through effort, not just age, not just in hanging around being a Christian long enough. The Christians who the Hebrew writer uh, talked about had this problem. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the Hebrew writer said, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now, my take about this scripture is that the Hebrew writer was talking to people that had been Christians for a period of time. And even though they had been Christians for a period of time, they just weren't maturing at the level they should be maturing at. And we get that old adage of they needed milk rather than solid food. Little babies need milk. They need milk because they can't yet digest solid food. When we mature in the Lord, we're able to take the solid food. And so, uh, again, even uh, those that had been Christians for a long period of time, uh, it does not mean that their problems have gone away. And here's number four on my list. And here's the fourth myth that I would like to deal with this evening. And the fourth myth is that one becomes spiritually mature without making some kind of sacrifice. I could have preached this lesson 50 years ago. Do you know what instant means? It almost seems like this is a problem of July the 9th, 2023. That's this evening. But it's not. It's always been that way. 
Preachers have always preached sermons and taught about how people want things instantly. Now, understand, we live in the information age, don't we? We don't have to wait till the 5 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news. It is a 24-hour news cycle. We don't need to wait until the sports comes on to find out if our team won or not. And we don't have to wait until the weather program comes on at 5.15 or 11.15 in the evening, I'm talking Eastern time, uh, as to what the weather is going to be. At the touch of a finger, we are able to instantly access that information. People in that vein would like to have spirituality instantly without any effort. Since we push buttons, since we ask Siri for an answer, so we go to Google and we type something in and we get the answer to our problems, we think that life works that way. Unfortunately, we think that spirituality works that way. No sacrifice, just push a button and we will be uh, physically mature without any effort whatsoever because it doesn't take an effort to push a button, does it? Jesus was very succinct in this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 when he said, if any man wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know what? <laughs> Any of you been on a diet? What usually happens with diets? With diets, you tell yourself, there are certain foods that I shouldn't eat, so I won't eat those foods. And instead of filling myself up to the point of, I can't eat anymore, we just uh, eat the food that we need uh, to live on, to be comfortable with. Sometimes in a diet, we need to deny ourselves those sweets and ice creams and fried foods that we might like. Now, in life, to deny ourselves uh, when we were baptized into Christ the Apostle Paul illustrated this for us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Here are the words. I have been crucified with Christ. Do you get that? There's a sacrifice that we've been made. We have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Brethren, spirituality comes only when we die to self and we live for Christ. And so as we review these four myths again, and let's do this real quickly. First, all of our problems will be solved by becoming a Christian. Second, uh, if you're having a problem, it means you're not spiritual. Third, that one becomes spiritually mature. I'm sorry, that just because one has been a Christian for a long time does not automatically mean he will or she will become mature. And finally, fourth, one become spiritually mature without making any sacrifice. And so what's the answer to this? I believe the answer comes in one word. It's called perseverance. The dictionary describes this as the act or fact of sticking to a purpose or an aim. A stronger meaning is the characteristic of a man who 
is who will not be moved away from his deliberate purpose or his loyalty to faith and piety, even by the greatest trials and sufferings. This is how we cope with these myths of life. It's through perseverance. It's through realizing that when we became a child of God, we made the right decision. And then the growth process begins. Success, I believe, is defined as getting up one more time when one has been knocked down. Paul used athletic analogies several times in his writings, as did the Hebrew uh, writer. He talks about running the race. He even talks about boxing, which was something that must have gone on in those days. Well, the metaphor here is that success is defined as when we get knocked down, that we get back up, because we're all going to get knocked down. The knockdowns are the problems of life that we must cope with day by day, and we must cope with the problems of life through perseverance. Jesus used this word in the parable of the seed. Uh, when he talked about the seed being sown in places that it wasn't able to grow. And finally, as we complete the lesson this evening, in Luke chapter 8, verse 15, it says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. You see, the Lord wants us to be the good soil. He wants us to be the ones when we hear the word that we're completely honest with ourselves and we have a good heart because of what we've done. And then we hold fast and then we bear fruit and we do that with perseverance. And so I hope that this lesson helped us to destroy some of the myths of coping with problems in our lives. Becoming a Christian isn't enough. It's maturing as Christians through getting into the word of the Lord and praying for the wisdom that James talks about in the first chapter of the book of James. I hope that lesson was beneficial to you. Uh, if you're here this morning, this evening, and you haven't started your walk with the Lord, uh, we know that in order to do that, we must confess Jesus as the Son of God. We must repent of our former lives and be baptized for the remission of our sins. If you have come to that decision this evening, I pray that if you want to be baptized, that you would contact one of us, and we would be glad to help you. As we close this service this evening, let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the life that you've given to us. And we realize that all lives have problems. You know, we can't have a rainbow without the rain. And the way that we cope with the problems that we have by being steadfast in the Lord is the way to understand that um, we must become spiritually mature and it takes work. It takes denying oneself. It takes growing in the Lord because when we make that commitment to the Lord, that's when Satan says, I'm going to break that commitment down. Let's be like Job. Let's be like Joseph. Let's be like Daniel. Let's defend our God and knowing that our God is a good and righteous God. I pray, dear God, that you will bless us this evening. And as we put our heads on our pillows, uh, that we will have you on our hearts, that we will have your son who died for our sins on our hearts. And we wake up in the morning that we will uh, start our day uh, in knowing that you are with us 
and that we must do your will. Be with us this evening. Help us to be your humble servants. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Celebrate Jesus.